The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy, and he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to the BS Report from the Song Conference here with Mark Cuban, Dallas Mavericks owner, world champion, guy who showed up late this weekend. Hey, I apologize for that. Um, um, I kind of schedule mess up, but I'm here. People in spite of you. like you want a you want a title now, and it's like you, you're too big to come to the conference for well, the weekend now. So can't that's true, it. but you know. <laughs> um, I I read something interesting. You said that actually I let you say it. What was the thing after you guys won the title? The thing that people said to you the most? Oh, they said thank you. That was it was crazy. You you know I I'd heard congratulations and this and that before, but the most amazing thing was in Dallas across the world really people just said thank you and it was it was it was cool because you know I think everybody looked at the heat as you know they were going to win no matter what we had no chance and um, obviously it turned out differently and the good guys won um, <laughs> But I'll tell you, the other thing was, right after we won, I won across and I shook hands with Mick Harrison, who's the owner of the Heat and a great guy. And he looks at me in the eye and he goes, the irony of it all, because last time we played them, right. we were the favorites and blew it. And now just the switch. So Mickey's a good guy. So, But it was still nice to kick his ass. So it's just a whole, su- <laughs> whole summer of people just coming up and saying, thank you, thank you, thank all you. All the time, yeah. I mean, it... And it feels great, you know, and I, I made a point to carry the trophy around with me as many different places. People are like, oh, you got to, you know, make sure this doesn't get scuffed. I'm like, hell no. I want this thing to, to look like it's been loved, right? That right. it's gotten some affection, you know, I'll, I'll scrape it. I don't care. And so I took it to, to everywhere. I mean, if you had a kindergarten class that wanted me to bring it to, I was bringing it to your kindergarten class. So, Did it make you mad that it, the, it's not like the NHL where you don't have a Stanley Cup that you can carry around and drink out of? That could have been more fun than that. Oh, no, I just had a very big cup I carried with it. Oh, good. That was no problem. (laughs) I did a podcast with Dirk last week who is um, still still seems like he's relishing the title. He's I mean, it's mentally just seems different. He's so happy. Yeah, you can it's, see it's it. shown in our last four games, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I can't tell you for J-Kid, Dirk, Jet, um, Trix, Sean Marion, um, just to be in the league so long and yeah. to all of a sudden have it come to fruition, um, it, it, it was special. It was special for all of us. What was your favorite story from, like, the... 24 hours right after you win like the story you tell is like the funniest celebration story or can you even remember anything that happened no I remember bits and pieces um <laughs> bits and pieces they're probably going to live um yeah. so background story the night before game six we were in Miami obviously and we took a bunch of Mavericks um customers out for drinks and they were staying at the Fountain Blue where this club big huge club called live is at and so you know if anybody knows me before a game like that I'm just on pins and needles not drinking not talking just kind of to myself and there's 4,000 people in this club it's enormous and the DJ spots me or someone tells him I'm there. And he goes, Mark Cuban in the house. And I'm expecting to hey. And he goes, you know what we do to Cubans in Miami? We smoke them. Let's go heat. So he's got the whole place doing, let's go heat, let's go heat. So next night we win. And we do the whole champagne pour, drinking the Budweiser. And they have special commemorative Budweiser. So obviously I had to make sure I get my money's worth on my special commemorative Budweiser and my champagne. And... Um, and, and so that was all cool. And then Jet goes, we got to go celebrate somewhere. I'm like, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> I'm like, we're going to live. So we, we put together a bus and we get most of the team and wives and everybody else. And we just bus it down to live. And we go walking in and I'm holding up the trophy. And I walk right to the DJ booth <laughs> holding up the trophy. And so, but it was cool. So all, all those Miami fans <laughs> turned into to Mavs fans. And we got Dirk and Jet and everybody up on the the stage and we're all singing we are the champions in front of heat 
fans um, holding up the trophy. So now the champagne nice. part of this whole celebration, because champagne makes you like lightheaded pretty quickly. But you're giving interviews and stuff. You're drinking like were you ever worried like, oh, oh maybe I shouldn't give this interview right now? Oh, hell no. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I wanted to have as many. Um, do you remember this, you know, or let me show you this video. What were you thinking then? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I was. And it was cool because, I mean, and I'll tell you another quick story about ESPN. So right afterwards, um, we're getting ready to interview. And obviously, I'm still really smiley. And they were asking me about the fans. And we had probably 3,000, maybe 4,000 yeah. Mavs fans in Miami. And at the end of the third quarter, the Miami fans were starting to leave. And the Mavs fans were chanting, let's go Mavs in Miami. And we're, you know, it's great, right? Because yeah. it, it sounds like a Mavs crowd. And so afterwards, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting with, I think Hannah Storm was getting ready to interview me. And I'm like, we just punked the out of Miami fans. I'm like, I'm going to say that on the air. She's like, and everybody heard that I said I was going to say it on the air. And so I said it, expecting them to beep it out, right? Uh -uh. I said, we, our fans punked the out of the Heat fans and Cuban swears on ESPN, right? <laughs> so that's how, where's John Walsh? That's how you guys really work. <laughs> You had uh, the old Mavs owner, Donald Carter, accept the trophy from Stern, robbing me of one of my all-time favorite moments that I've dreamed of, which is Stern <laughs> handing you the trophy. And I had a terrible jersey me. ready to go, too. Yeah. Oh, why? Why? I just thought it was the right thing to do. Um, I'm so superstitious that I literally would not let our operations people for our games in Dallas, um, they wanted to have confetti come down if we won. I'm like, uh-uh. We can't we can't jinx ourselves, and all kinds of superstitions. If you watch, if you watch like the whole game when they show me, my head's always down because I have to drink my diet coke at just the right time because that helps us get stops or helps us get a basket. Yeah. And so, and so, um, because I'm so stupid stitious, um, <laughs> the one thing that I would let myself plan is I, I told them before the game that if we won because. Little backstory: um, When we, the last game, when we were playing the Lakers in that series, Donald Carter, who's the founding owner of the Mavs um, and now a minority owner still, he had a heart procedure, and he's like, "Mark, if we can win, that would just be the crowning moment of my life." Yeah. You know, and so he missed one game, and you know, it was just, it, fortunately, it wasn't anything serious, too serious, and he was back, and so I just thought, you know, that would be the right thing to do, and so when. Um, they were putting the rope around and getting, you know, it was evident we were going to win. Um, I told um, David Stern, I said, I, I want David, I want um, Donald Carter to accept the trophy for me because it's the right thing to do. And so there you go. And then Stern said, that's good because I wasn't crazy about giving it to you anyway. So this is a good compromise for us. No, he said, you're, you're not going to get naked like you said, are you? No. <laughs> Did you, you know, I think Derek even admitted it. I mean, he had a real letdown afterwards. I think he had trouble, you know, he just worked so hard for so long and had so much baggage from 2006 and 2007. And I think he had real trouble motivating himself heading into the season. Did you feel that way about you as an owner? No, um, because I was dealing with the lockout the whole time. Right? Yeah. You talk about a whole lot of nothing to accomplish nothing. Um, but that's a different topic. Yeah. What's what's the statistical breakdown of the uh, lockout? What 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 analytics can we uh, make from it? Um, there were a whole lot of people. The, the return on our investment in hours. Let's just say there's going to be about a 90-year horizon before we get in. It was just ridiculous. We, I mean, the amount of time we spent. And what versus what we actually were able to come to a conclusion on was the biggest waste of time ever. And you arrived at a place that everybody knew on July 4th weekend you would arrive at. Like pretty much exactly. Yeah. It was ridiculous. And lost 16 games in the process and they had this condensed schedule. Well, the condensed schedule is even worse. So you talk yeah. about Dirk and, you know, the older guys get, you know, if you're in the league 12, 13, 14 years, obviously you've had some level of success. You don't just accidentally find your way to, to 14 years in the NBA. And so you, mentally and physically you put yourself through a process. 
and that process all got blown up. And so, you know, for teams with older guys like ours, the Celtics, whatever, it's been far more difficult because, you know, it's a lot more brains than bronze versus the younger teams. And we knew this going in, that the younger teams, you know, 22 to 25-year-olds, you're always in shape. You just roll the ball out and, you know, you're in shape. And so, you know, they don't need as much practice time because they rely more on athleticism and, and different skills. Whereas our teams, you know, we won last year because we were able to prepare for teams and we were able to to practice and and implement things that coach put together so and the the bigger point there I think as it applies to this season is the regular season is not going to be any indication of what happens in the postseason because when you're playing nine games in 12 days like we are now you have no time to practice you have no time to prepare it's more like a pickup game and so you know they'll say well we're going to guard it this way and it's so much more difficult to implement when you're tired or you have to go deeper into your bench or you're playing guys 20 minutes or 25 minutes when you'd like to play them 35 because of the schedule that you're not going to have the same type of basketball in the playoffs. And that's why you said earlier when we were talking like you just want to make the playoffs you don't care about the season. Yeah, I mean it's almost like you know the 98 lockout season where the Knicks were like 27 and 23 and, and made it to the finals. And you're going to see the same thing this year because again, younger, more athletic teams are going to have an advantage because they're always in shape. It's a lot more, they don't tire as much. Excuse me, and the teams they're playing really can't prepare for them. But come playoff time, you know, you're playing a series with just the one team and everything you do is going to be geared in preparation for that team. And so it's going to be completely different. And as that applies to analytics, all the data is dirty this season because nothing that you can do can quantify um, how tired teams are or the fact that they're they haven't had time to prepare you know one of the practice practice I mean Allen Iverson you know there's a reason why we gave him Right. Yeah. Practice, practice, practice matters, particularly in the playoffs. So you have to prepare, and because you don't have that, and you know, and that also goes to an analytics question: What's the value of coaching? Right? We talk about player valuation, and you look at lineups, and then you see, you know, depending whether you what, what type of analytics you use, what coaches use what lineups. Well, because you're facing such a compressed schedule, you're not always in a position to use your best lineups, and that not not only skews the analytics for your own team, but also also for the team that you're playing. So, you know, you can basically throw out your all your analytics for this type of season. Did you guys study the 98-99 season at all to see if there were any lessons to be learned? Yeah, the lesson is, you know, an 18 made it to the finals. And right. so, you know, and because it's different, that was 50 games and actually a little bit more reasonable time than this schedule is. So yeah. there, there's really no pre- precedent that we could work from. Well, I mean, you're one of the owners. You had a vote. Like, why did, why was the schedule allowed? <laughs> Yeah, I had to vote, and I voted no. Yeah. See where it got me? (laughs) So you guys vote on something like that, or did that come from the players? I don't know. I don't know the history of it. No, I mean, it it was jointly, the players and um, the union and the... The The players get more money for the extra games. You guys make more money for the gates. And we beat the hell out of players along the way. Right, so it's two extra games a month, but we're already seeing the effects. And I think it's going to get much worse the next eight weeks. It's it's, it's already horrible. Yeah. Right? And like I said, you just want to survive and make the playoffs. Nothing else matters. Everything else is just Mr. Goss. I, I like to think of you as a guy who is a common sense kind of guy. I think that's why we like each other. Oh, you'd be wrong. Um, <laughs> you, I mean, I, how close did you come to going crazy during this lockout? You must have been going nuts. Oh, no, actually, I liked it. Oh. What do you mean? Oh, that trophy. I had lots of places to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I had lost, you I were milking gone. it. Yo, I was milking the hell out of it. Um, you know, anybody have a kindergarten class that need me to bring their trophy to? Yeah. Um, but the, what was driving me crazy was being in those meetings and just sitting there 12, 13, 14 hours. Anything happen? I know that now I found out that Jimmy Dolan plays guitar and is really good at telling jokes. Um, <laughs> you know, all the stuff that I had no intention and no desire to learn, I learned. Is there a better way to do that process? Because, you know, I, I was stunned by how many people were in those meetings. Like, at some point, don't you just get, hey, here's our three best, here's your three best, let's figure this out. No one's going to tweet this, right? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll capsulize it and I'll say it like this. Most people think NBA stands for National Basketball Association. MBA really stands for nothing but attorneys. That's all you need to know. Well then. <laughs> so you were faced with a very interesting 
basketball decision mm-hmm. that I did not agree with. You'd be surprised to know. Usually yeah, I agree you don't with know the s- you do. I, I know. You don't care. Um, Tyson Chandler, who I felt like was, He's other than Dirk, the biggest reason why you beat Miami. He was a key Protected the rim. Absolutely. He had figured out LeBron and Wade, how to stop him. He was the last line of defense. Did a great job for you. Is that what you really think? That's what I really think. Like I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would, say, I would say he was... No, Tyson was critical. The and second Tyson, most valuable guy you had in that series. Tyson was critical, and I'd say his value was just as strong in the locker room as it was on the court. And there's no question we were, you know, that was important to us last year, and he was a key component. So you had a choice between you could sign him probably four years, 54, 55 million, something like that or let him go and you have cap space in a year. I think you're at, you could do some things, there's and it, it wasn't really about having cap space next year. It's a, w- you've got to understand that um, with a new CBA, there's a whole new set of rules. Mm-hmm. And it, it's really almost like when Sarbanes-Oxley came into the stock market or whatever, you, there's, because of the new set of rules, there's, there's going to be a different market for pricing players. And when there's a different market for pricing players, there's a different, you've got to introduce a different methodology for building a team. And you couldn't just use the same approach that we used in the past. Right. In the past, I could fix any mistake just by spending money. Now, and you did, and I did, right? And and so now it wasn't just about spending more money because it was a lot more money. What would have been what was 19 million dollars in luxury tax last year would have been more than 65 million under the new rules in year three or Oof. later, right? But not only that, there's also restrictions on how you can add players. So now, if you look at the Heat. Um, as an example, they um, because they're going to be over the luxury tax for the next three years, put aside the financial side of it, they can only use the mini mid-level and minimums to add a player. That's a big restriction. Yeah. Right? So it raises the question, is having three stars or two stars the best way to build a team? Or is there going to be a repricing, particularly in year three of the collective bargaining agreement when the luxury tax... Um, Ex- escalates and there's doublers and all those types of things, or will the market for players reprice themselves? So a player that might have been a 12 or 14 million dollar player this year or before might be six million dollars or seven. So you can have one star and three really, really, really good all stars and package those guys together to build a winning team, knowing and still maybe leave yourself some flexibility that if somebody gets hurt, you still have your full mid level to add. Or do you sign three max out guys who are going to very quickly be $60 million or let's just say $54 million out of the $70 million in cap, you know, and those numbers will stay basically relative. And now you have $16, $16 million for the next 12 players on your roster and you only have $2.5 million basically um, to add another player of any consequence forevermore. We have to give the Knicks fans like five more seconds to stop thinking about Amari Stoudemire's contract. So just let's, on their own, they can step there. Um, you had probably, what, two weeks from when you knew what this deal was going to be to when you could start signing guys and deciding your roster. And as you said, you had this totally different economic system. How many people did you have working on this, trying to figure out what the voids were, what this was going to look like in year three, the path, all that stuff? How many people were working on it? I mean, me and Roland Beach, basically, but primarily me, because I can't really, I've got to learn the CBA. So you would think because I was on the committee, I would have an, an advantage, but what was finally agreed to wasn't anything that I really could anticipate. So the day it was agreed to, and then they had to go through um, cleaning up all the language from the day it was finalized. I just had to sit there and grind on it like everybody else. And then from take, taking that, that language, I had to just try to go through the, the game theory, or whatever you want to call it, of how I thought the market would play out. And you know what I, the conclusions I come to might be completely different than what Daryl or anybody else comes to. Obviously, I hope Daryl is just disgustingly wrong, and they go 0 and 82 for the rest. No, kidding, Daryl. <laughs> but uh, he'd say the same thing about me too. So, but that's the challenge, right? So you can't just give that to somebody else and say, "Well, you figure this out for me." There's, there's just too much at stake, and so. You know, and, and plus, I think market evaluations, whether it's stock market or other markets, something that I enjoy, so it was actually fun to dig into. 
So would you say this is the single toughest system to operate under that you've had since you were the owner? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because basically there's only been one system. I mean, there's been little changes and little nuances um, in the first deal I was involved with and the one that was signed six years ago, but this is night and day difference. Um, and it still didn't really fix our problems, but it changed the game. Now, if you did have Tyson this season, do you feel like, I feel like the team would be a favorite in the West? I don't you think disagree? it makes any difference. Yeah. I mean, our challenge we're having, the challenges we're having now aren't, are just, you know, the compressed schedule, you know, and injuries. Um, I mean, I literally think we're a better team than we are, than we were last year. Um, but it's hard when you don't have all your guys or you're playing nine games in 12 days. There's no, there's no indication, right? And again, Tyson's a great player, nothing to take, but, but Wood, uh, Brendan Haywood has really stepped up his game. Brandon Wright has given us things we didn't have before. Sean Marin, you know, you know how I feel about what he's been doing defensively. Um, You've been tweeting about it. Yeah, because I, I think, you know, people don't really pay attention to, to those types of things. People kind of go by conventional wisdom, what they read in the media, and from there they come to their conclusions when if you watch somebody play on an ongoing basis, you know, you talk about guarding the basket, but in reality, Guarding the perimeter makes it a whole lot different because if you look at, and again, not taking anything away from Tyson, if you look at his fouls per minute, the better perimeter defense we play, the lower his fouls per minute. Right. If you look at the games that he, or Brandon Haywood for that matter, had to come out of earlier, right, including in the finals, well, that's a reflection of how we defend on the perimeter. And so what we tried to do was shore up, knowing that we we're losing Tyson, we tried to shore up our perimeter defense because historically in our centers have had a fouls per minute problem. And if you don't guard on the perimeter, you get a baby in a dog collar. You get fouls per minute, right? And and that's part of the challenge. And so that's why I, I think people really, really undervalue a Sean Marion um, and any, you know, and a Dante, Delonte West. Delonte West is a great perimeter defender. Now, everybody's, you know, suffers in the high pick and roll. When you've got somebody, you know, Chris Paul or now a Jeremy Lin who really knows how to play the high pick and roll, you know, you're always going to have challenges there, and that's when you want speed to scramble and all that kind of stuff. But you, uh, you can't just have somebody guard the rim because that guy's going to foul out in five minutes. Why? Uh, it, it seems like all these teams now are using stats for the most part that are the same stats. Yep. And at this point, why wouldn't they just be public? Why couldn't I know everything that you know? You probably do. I mean... The stuff that you see in a box score is pretty much worthless, right? And a lot of people use that and try to come out with that. Um, I mean, one of the reasons I was a big investor in Synergy Sports um, is because I wanted them to go in a different direction where they're logging things. And so there's things that obviously are very public. Then we try to take some of that data and go a little bit further. Um, but it, it's really what you log that's going to create the difference. I mean, we have four people during games, at the games, logging stuff in real time so that we're able to make decisions and then Roland kind of encapsulates it all. Um, so it, that's the data that, that really matters on a, on a minute by minute basis and allows coach to make in-game decisions. And for you, I think a big part of the title you would agree was the fact that your coach uses that stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and I some mean, coaches just don't. Well, everybody's got their own approach, but I think Rick Carlisle is phenomenal in-game coach. And he's a phenomenal coach at preparing, and he knows how to, to, to use that information. And, you know, we have something called the Rick Report that comes out of there after every game that just capsulizes all the things he's used in the game and, you know, gives him a feel for what worked. Because coaches need to know, you know, the score isn't always a reflection of what worked. You might have a game where, you know, like last night, the last two nights, right, coaches make decisions where when you have nine games in 12 nights, you say, okay, do I give up a little? bit and play deeper into my bench to try to save some minutes, then you go back and you look at the reports, you know, our starters are plus seven, and this new combination that hasn't really played together was plus, minus eight, and we lose the game by one point, you know? Those are the tough decisions that really are impacted in this type of schedule yeah. that we'll hopefully learn from, but you're not going to see the same type of decisions in the playoffs. The the big move in the finals was when Berea went into the starting lineup, and seemed like it just shifted. I think other things were shifting in the yeah, series, but yeah. that was one of the temples. I, I How much of a statistical decision was that for you? You'd have to ask Rick, honestly. I mean, I know we all looked at all the data, um, but I think the reality was that we kept on adjusting. The, our feeling in the locker room after game three 
And it was pretty much consistent in, in all the series. Our guys had so much confidence in the adjustments Rick was going to make in series that as each series went on, our confidence grew and grew and grew. And I think that was a huge differentiator. I don't think it was just JJ. Um, you know, it was, and not to take, JJ was great, obviously, but it was our coverages and how we, how we guarded different things and, you know, where we put LeBron and D Wade on the court, you know, how he ran D Wade into Brian Cardinal, you know, as yeah. many times as we could, yeah. right? Um, just little things like that, that over the course, people don't understand, like over the course of what could potentially be a seven game series, it's all the little nuances that can make a huge difference. You know, there aren't a lot of guys in this league who can handle being double teamed for seven games in a series and do it for multiple series. Dirk has become one of those guys. He doesn't care. When yep. the game's on the line, he will take that ball. Whereas you watch some other guys, stars, who when they're double teamed, they're big first game, second game, third game. By the fourth game, they're worn out. And that used to be the Dirk and the Mavs, right? Because that wore him down. And he got, I think it's more mental than physical. But, you know, that that's a huge difference in the series. When you think about, like, you know, you're going to have all this cap space, I think for the first time since you've ever been an owner. Yeah, right? it, it, well, that, it, it, that wasn't the plan. Um, I made the, the inf, in our infinite wisdom, we were going to have big time cap space when Jawan jo- Howard came off the books, and we went for Rafe LaFrance and Tariq Abdul Had. That was oh, you know, I remember not, that. not one of my I think best I made games. fun of those moves. Yeah, and deservedly <laughs> so. Yeah, that was the one time you got it right. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so this summer you have all this cap space. So you, is it almost seems like. Uh, you're like this billionaire who's like, hey, I have a pool this summer. This is going to no, be not, awesome. Not necessarily, right? There's nothing that says we don't just keep our same guys, right? You, again, there's there's a variety of options. It's, it's pure market theory. You've got to see how the market prices itself. So if you look at it, this year there's a ton of cap room. I was talking with Daryl. Yeah. Chances are because everybody's got so much cap room, there's going to be it's going to be inflationary, and that's not a good time to buy. And so it's, sure, Deron Williams, Dwight Howard, all these guys that people talk about are out there, but that might not be the best decision for us. It may be better for us to pay our existing guys, keep our existing guys. It may be better for us to wait another year because in the third year of the CBA, the new tax kicks in with the the big escalators. um, And then that could push down the price of players. So we might be in a better position waiting for year three or year four, just depending on what it is, to be able to go out and get that, you know, compliment to Dirk or, you know, the next dark or whatever it may be but that goes into the thought process so despite what all, all of the media is writing we don't have just one um, approach in mind we really are trying to to be smart and, and be opportunistic let's say you owned a small market team let's let's say you owned I don't know New Orleans New Orleans, New Orleans moves to Anaheim and you're the owner of Actually, that's not a that's a, a small that's a medium sized market. That's a big market. Let's actually. say you take over New Orleans. Okay. Let's say Stern says. I, actually, I did. But <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, Get that. Yeah. Stern says to you, please do this for me for three years. Turn Dallas over to somebody else and try to fix this New Orleans thing. Take over a small market. It'll be really fun for you to do this. It'll be a big challenge. How would you run a small market team? Same way I run the Mavs. No difference. Same way? Yeah, exactly. You wouldn't be able to do it the same way, though. What's that? You wouldn't have the same, you wouldn't be able to spend as much. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, if you, you still have to take the same approach to building a team. And it's not just about how much money you spend. Um, again, because the rules are different now. And so I think that, like I said, the market will reprice. And that's why I was so giving you stern so much about um, the Chris Paul trade. It wasn't about who it went to or anything like that. It was the fact that we just went through this lockout. And one of the tenets of the new collective bargaining agreement was any size market, you, the, the incumbent with a free agent will have an advantage. And here they are just saying, screw it, you know, we're not going to take advantage of that opportunity after we just had a lockout to get that opportunity. And so I think um, I would approach it the exact same way. Now, if I was making the trades for them, and I'll, I'll tell you one of my rules. If, if I'm ever going to trade a top 10 player, you have to get rid of at least your worst contract, if not your two worst contracts, to clear Period. your books. Period. End of story, right? Because there's so much assert- uncertainty associated with any players that you bring in, any draft picks you bring in. Because of that uncertainty, you've got to ha- be able to come as close as you can to a clean slate. And so I think that was, you know, putting on my 130th ownership, or 129th ownership perspective of the Hornets, that was the mistake they made. And that's not Dell Demps, because he's, he's actually a super smart guy and I think um, will be a great general manager in this league for a long time to come. I think that was, you know, the commissioner not knowing what he's doing. 
Well, and, <laughs> and also, you, you're coming right out of the lockout. That was like, what, three three weeks later, two weeks later, something like that. And yep. it just seems there was a lot of confusion with what kind of power. I mean, you had teams dealing with New Orleans, thinking that Dems had certain power to do certain things. And but that's not unusual, right? And, and I've said that before, that I've been involved with multiple trades that I thought were, um, our, Donnie Nelson, our GM, had told me were done and that the other owner had agreed to, only to find out that that was not the case. Right. So it's, you know, owners get cold feet. Owners, you know, think things is over and, and change their mind. And so, you know, that wasn't so much unusual at all. You have a cold feet story for us? Um, not that one, no, I, that, not that I should tell. No. Okay, <laughs> thought maybe I could rope you into it. Yeah, you know, one of the things that happened with that trade was it got leaked that the trade happened, and mm-hmm. I think that was the league kind of panicked because you know they kind of agreed, and then it had to go, and then it comes out, and then it, it seemed like Stern and whoever panicked and just voided. I don't it. think you know what. To David's credit, he doesn't panic. I, I don't think that's his style. Um, I think. But why not say, let's wait 24, give us 24 hours, we own this team, this is a dicey situation, we just want to review the details of this trade before No one reveals decision. that much, no team reveals that much, and there was it's no It's a re- unique situation. Not that unique, right? I mean, as much as you guys wanted to play it that way, it wasn't. What's with the you guys stuff? The media, you know, <laughs> there, there's reality and then there's what you guys saying right. Um, <laughs> It's still, the league owns the team. That's, I'm going to say that's a unique situation. It is a unique situation, but that doesn't require any more disclosure than any other team. There's no good reason for them to disclose more or talk more about it. Well, we live in this world where it seems like stuff gets leaked constantly, and now it almost seems like it's gone another level where, let's say I own whoever, I own Phoenix, and I want the Celtics. I would love to see you own a team so I'd be just great. crush I'd be the, the hell best. out of you. <laughs> I'd have such a good Wi-Fi service in my arena. I'd be laughing at you. You know what? Yes, you would, because no one would have any interest at all in watching your team play. (laughs) They'd be texting how happy they were. Um, But with the leaks, it seems like you could basically just sabotage the trade value of another player. I could leak to a reporter or whoever and say, Celtics are shopping. Rondo, like nuts. You're not gonna, he's going to every, every team in the league. And then the guy's like, oh, I trust this guy, I'll run it. And then well, people maybe do that that's all the time. not true. Oh, no. That I mean, seems look, like a relatively you guys, new thing. No, no, it's not, not new at all. I well, mean, it's new in the last couple of years. No, like internet, no, boom, no. it's on the tickers. It, it's not new, but it actually, teams do that just to elicit a response. You know, not, not just to try to mess with other teams, but to see if other teams are interested. It, it, it's amazing how, how often that a team will say, yeah, you know, I hear the Celtics are looking to trade Michael Olawa Candy, you know, and and, you know, just to see if anybody calls them, you know, so it's them saying, you know, we heard or getting a reporter to say we heard and that's a rumor because they're interested in moving the player. And that happens all the time. Michael Olakani's not in the league anymore. That's why I used him. <laughs> oh, that was good. That was smart. Yeah. But it does seem like uh, it's so hard to keep stuff in house. Like how many people do you truly trust? Let's say somebody no, comes yeah, to I'll you tell with you what, an I awesome take, offer. I take pride. I take pride that you hear about Maverick Trades when they happen, when we announce them. Right. You don't, you, I can't think of the last time that you've heard about a deal that we pulled ahead of the time, ahead of time. And because we know, because over, over, over time and, and experience, you know which people you talk to in other organizations that it ends up becoming public through which, whichever platform. And I know which people in our organizations we discuss trades with. And there's only three, me, Coach, and Donnie Nelson. That's it. No one else gets involved in trade. Three market. people, that's it. Everybody that's else it. is out. So now another team approaches you. Let's say the wrong person approaches you. Do you even trust having the conversation with that person? Well, no, right? It'll, Donnie, Donnie has the conversations, and it'll be like, he'll know not to make any commitments whatsoever. Right? You know, he's not going to, he's going to be as noncommittal as he possibly can and just say, you know, we'll get back to you. We'll put it on our board and get back to you. And right. then, so you know. I mean, you could just go down the list of each team and point, it's going to get out, it's going to get out, it's going to get out, it's going to get out. And those are the teams you hear the rumors about all the time. Now, you might hear rumors about the Mavericks, but we surprise you every time. If you go back and look at the last 10 trades we've made and then look for you know rumors about it, maybe somebody got lucky and guessed. Maybe going back to the Jason Kidd trade, that was the last one because every, everybody knew we were out there trying to get the trade done. Right. But other than that... 
And stuff can get twisted around. Like, so, like let's say New Jersey could call you and they offer you Brooke Lopez for Dirk Nowitzki, and you say, "No, nah, we're not doing that." And you hang up, and then they could say, "We talked about Dirk for Lopez with Cuban." Yeah, you know, and that and, and that they, they did. That's they did. really if that's a problem for a team, that's a symptom of another problem, right? So if if a guy, if you're talking about one of our guys, look with all the stuff with Lamar right now, right? Yeah. And so I'm talking to Lamar all the time. We're texting back and forth. We're talking on the phone we're meeting you know because he's so public because of the reality show and the different types of media covering it all that is it's a completely different situation and we've got to have the infrastructure and the pieces in place to support him but the types of things that Lamar is going through other players it happens all the time yeah. right just like in any business right um, it happens all the time and you just have to have an organization that has the support infrastructure to be able to help players deal with those issues we did the fanalytics panel earlier that you were you were back there watching traveling. Show. You saw some of it. Um, what do you think with ticket dynamic pricing going forward? Like, what are your opinions on that? You know, the, everybody talks about how. Um, well, okay, there, there's there's resale and there's dynamic pricing. I'm I'm fine with dynamic pricing um, or variable pricing for certain situations, um, but I don't think that you can just say one one size fits all that you can always use it or not because it really is a reflection on how variable your sales are in general right so we've got a very high season ticket base and so we use the we, we limit our season tickets so that we have the ability for more fans to come to games mm -hmm. and that is a different sales approach than just trying to maximize revenue so we might price tickets in a way but also sell those tickets to a specific type of customer which accomplishes something completely different than just trying to maximize revenue. How much are you guys interested in capturing the individual fan behavior and what they do? And like, would you want to get to a day where you could know that this guy came to eight games and he ordered this, these food and these drinks and stuff like that? I mean, the answer is yes, but it's not a priority. Right. right? So right now, data management, big data, being able to look at all the information you have and trying to come up with maximizing revenue per customer is, is something that you know any good business should do. But then the question is how far do you dig in with that versus where you think what really drives the value creation in the experience, right? So with the Mavs, if I have, I mean, we try to do a little bit of everything, but our focus has always been in value creation built around the experience. Because to me, you have to ask yourself, what's, what's the product, right? And I know you talk about, you know, the team. And the reality is we, we don't sell basketball. We sell entertainment. We sell unique experiences. You know, going to a sporting event is one of the few times you can have a guy like me actually high-fiving a guy like you, because otherwise I won't give you the time of day, right? Um, <laughs> So, but that creates a unique experience. And I think the number one thing, so if I had to, to drill it all down, the number one thing that, that I focus on more than anything else, you know the feeling when you walk into a game, any game, and you can feel the energy? There, there's an absolute difference between walking into a game where you can feel the crowd, you can feel the energy, and that, that's what makes, I think, going to a game unique. Yeah. To me, that is the one thing, the only thing I focus all my energy on, right? How can I make it so that when people come to a game, they're excited? Because when they're excited, that energy comes out and you feel, everybody feels it when they walk in. And we're one of the few places you can go knowing you're going to get that experience. You can't do that at the movies. You can't do that at a restaurant. You can't do that in most places. And so that's why, you know, the Wi-Fi thing and everything, I don't want people looking down. I want people looking up and contributing to the energy because that's what's so compelling and differentiated about going to one of our games versus anything else you can do in the entertainment universe. So I spend far more money than anyone else, far more time than anybody focusing on those things because that's what sells. To me, that's what creates value um, in the ticket pricing that I'm going to be able to sell, maybe even if our team's not quite as good. 
But at the same time, we're living in a society where people like to do three things at once. I'm sure people are looking down right now, texting as we're talking. I'm like, sure they are because we're up here fight? talking. That's the difference, right? <laughs> right? No, I don't have a problem with that because they're going to do it anyways. You know, it, look, it, it doesn't take a lot of work just to, to type in ESPN.com or Yahoo Sports or whatever. I don't have to, I don't have to do anything more to, to help you with that. So if I have the choice between trying to compete with ESPN and Yahoo and maybe, you know, do some sort of online ordering or maybe, you know, do gamifying, going to a Mavs event so that you can check in or you can get points or, you know, if I can get your text number, then I can do different things. That's all fine, but that's on the margin. That really does that's not going to give people a reason to come to a Mavs game, right. right? Because you can get better stats or whatever. But if you know every time you walk into the American Airlines Center, you just feel it, right? And people are high-fiving or people are pumped up or they're singing or they're chanting. You know, like when Jonathan was talking about EPL games, when there's a different type of atmosphere, yeah. when the whole city, you know, just converges on, on a stadium. That's, that's really where I want to focus my energies because the, that's the one thing you can't recreate. I think the best example of that was game five of the finals last year. Because it was coming off that the uh, the Dirk was sick and then LeBron had that weird fourth quarter. And I think there was just such an interest in that game and such an energy. And people were there like 45 minutes before the game. It seemed like it was like two thirds filled. Yeah, people I mean, like when you, when you walk into the arena, like particularly for playoff finals, whatever, and the whole place is going, let's go Mavs, and there's 30 minutes before game yeah, time. Yeah, that's pretty cool. You can't recreate that, but that's I'll spend more time trying to figure out, okay, do we use the maniacs? One of our, you know, do we use the dancers? Do we use jumbotron? Do we, you know, use prompts? Do we set up things in the stands? You know, I'll spend more time trying to figure that out to try to get people started in that, and then you know. And I have an automatic, you're fired policy if you do the wave. Seriously. If you do it, like I had somebody who d- didn't know that they would be fired this year who tried to get the wave started. Oh, I was God. like, you were not read the policy. You get one warning. Yeah. And I'll say it to everybody here. Anybody that ever works for the Mavericks, ever tries to do the wave, you're fired. <laughs> there, there's no policy. bigger, yeah. There's no bigger energy killer than doing the wave, right? I'd rather have 60 minutes of kiss cam. <laughs> When did you build your arena? Um, it was built in 2001. All right, that's 11 years ago. Yep. And it was a state-of-the-art arena at the time. Yep. The, the phrase state-of-the-art is... We keep on upgrading it. We, keep, we put in a completely new sound system that's... Um, directional and location controllable. We have the largest indoor high def um, screen system um, for people to look at. Now it's controllable and you know it's just a, another digital output device that we can do anything with. So we've really made an investment to try to make sure that we stay fresh in terms of all those things. Where do you, let's say you were building that arena right now. How would it be different than the one you built in 2001? Probably fewer suites. That's the only thing that would be Fewer different. suites, why? Yeah. Because those are tough to sell in an economy Especially like the corners? Not even especially the corners because, you know, there's 41 plus playoffs Mavs games, but there's stars and there's other events. And if the stars aren't doing well and we want to try to sell you both through the arena, then it becomes very difficult. How many seats do you think is the best possible arena? Honestly, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't given it any thought. I don't know. If you could do yours over again, how many seats would you do? I'd probably keep it exactly the same. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because it's not too big, not too small. Um, and it's just, again, the challenge is just suites. It's just configuration. Not number, it's configuration. So with statistics, we do you feel like we've maxed that? Like, what is the next thing that you're interested in? Because you've, it feels like you've... You're getting all the data that you need now for the stuff that's up you win, but what's the next frontier for it? I think the next frontier is influencing the numbers as opposed to just creating, you know, I mean, there's the, you know, we'll get into biomechanics and um, real-time sourcing of players' information and, you know, saliva testing in-game and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think the psychological side is probably the area we're focused on the most and have been probably for the last three years. Um, the the psychology and culture and co- integrating coaching and players and the definition of what an NBA player is we try to really um, when you when you play for the when you come to the Mavs for the first time um, as a rookie in particular we set a program for you that this is what we expect from you as a Dallas Maverick and as an NBA professional and we'll have somebody sit down and outline your goals outline your workout programs outline off the court you know what's expected of you and we work with you to stick to that program and if you can't stick to it you're gone 
Do you, what about like studying, like we were talking about this yesterday on one of the panels, studying the minutes and how they're dispersed in games. Like, is there any area there? Is that just team by team doesn't, hard to tell? I mean, yeah, I mean, look, there, you can look at effectiveness at whatever analytics you're doing, you can always break down to a different type of metric, like per minute or whatever it may be. And you can do it on per minute. Oh, thank you very much. Because I got a raise. <laughs> But yeah, I don't see that as being something that, that's hugely advantageous. How about uh, the European stats? Like something like Ricky Rubio, he goes over to Europe, his stats are terrible, everybody decides he's gonna stink, comes over, he's great. How do we translate the European stuff to what we're seeing? Here? Actually, as long as you guys think that he's gonna stink because you're using European stats, that's fine by me. So you thought, even though the stats were there, you weren't deceived? Well, I mean, they play a different game. You can't use that as, you, there's, there's not necessarily going to be a correlation between stats over there and what happens in an NBA game. It's a different game. There's nothing we can learn from European, anything other than the scouting? There's not one thing? I think coaching, some of the coaching styles um, are different. Um, you know, like Mike D'Antoni style that's come over and some other folks, E. Tori, I forget his last name, the Messino, whatever. There's some guys that have done some really smart things over there in terms of offense in particular. I mean, and Donnie Nelson is, is so tuned in over there on that. that um, yeah, you always want to learn and, and there's always room to improve, and particularly on the coaching side. And, you know, but, you know, you look at their practice habits, it's completely different. You know, they're practicing multiple times a day in a lot of cases, but they're also playing a lot fewer games and they're playing fewer minutes. So it, it's not, it's a completely different game. You said uh, on your blog, I think on Wednesday, you were saying you gave advice to people to make money. Uh -huh. And the two things you said was to sell shoelaces mm -hmm. and to learn how to program remote controls. Yep. Explain. <laughs> Well, first, let me. I wrote a book, an ebook, How to Win at the Sport of Business. If I can do it, you can do it. Two dollars and fifty-one cents on Amazon. So that was kind of that's kind of the preface Ooh. for the whole thing. Um, you can now you can look down and buy it right now if you so choose. Nice. Um, but the whole idea was, you know, with Shark Tank and everything in particular now, everybody comes to me on continuously. Oh, I want to make money. I want to make money. And I go to a lot of schools and even parents. How can my son make money? How can my daughter make money? So I, I just decided one day, okay, I'm going to try to think of two things off the top of my head, just like that, that I could just write down that anybody who could walk, talk, and chew gum could make money at. And so I thought, okay, if I had to just go out there and, you know, time wasn't the issue and just make enough money to, you know, go on a date or whatever, what, what could I do? I thought, shoelace, right? Every, you know, most people just wear the laces that come with their shoes, you know, their running shoes, whatever. But if we were at MIT game or Harvard, or maybe not, if we went to an SEC game or we went to a Pats game or whatever, a Pats game, right? And I, I bought a box of shoelaces that probably cost me a buck a, a, a buck a, a pair. And I just put up a sign, if Jonathan would let me, saying, you know, Pats, you know, um, Boston Patriots color shoelaces and gave you five different styles, you know, missionary style the basic cross right 20 bucks and I'll put in Pat's colors and you just sit there and then maybe cross and whatever other types of styles you know an extra 10 bucks and then plus tips course of a you know all the tailgate and everything you might be able to make 100 200 dollars a game which for us just any 18 year old kid or whatever 21 35 55 year old kid you know isn't bad and then remote control you're adding to something with this one it's the remote control thing's a real thing. I was, I was jealous that I hadn't thought of that idea myself. It's a good and, one. And then remote control, like I just got in a remote control and I was like, okay, now I got to read the freaking manual, right? And I could, and I started to, and I was like, oh my Lord, this is painful. It's like landing a plane. Yeah, it is like landing, it's, it's, pain, it's painful, right? And so I thought, you know what? If someone would just take the time to memorize and learn the, the how to program the top five brands of remote controls, and then go set up business cards and little um, postcards at all the local electronics stores, Targets, Walmarts, wherever they sell these remote controls, and charge 20 bucks a pop, you know, make some tips on top of that, you can have a nice little business for a kid who's in school. So those are, then the point was, if I could just sit there and come up with two ideas, it's not about raising money, it's not about coming up with the, the, the next big thing, that there's a thousand ideas that are out there that anybody can come up with as a way that can offer service or a product, whatever, that makes money. And at this conference, you have so many people who are in college or just out of college and they're... They want to do something in sports. Yeah, because Maybe. they sent their, I can see it now. Mom, I'm starting a new business. Oh, MIT, Harvard, they taught you a lot. 
shoelaces, mom, <laughs> shoelaces. Um, and then you can analyze, okay, how many turns per minute in a shoe so that you can maximize your output. The PR of the shoelaces. <laughs> um, you have all these people that went, you know, how do I get into this business? Like, what do you think? Sports What's your answer when people ask you that? I'll tell you exactly what I told somebody about an hour ago. Don't. Seriously. The worst possible business in the world for a college graduate to try to get into because it doesn't pay right? There's a thousand people applying for every job. And at least for us, when I try to hire, I don't look for sports management. Sports management is the new rocks for jocks. Sorry. Hold on. Yeah. Everybody's devastated. Give you know, a second to regroup. You got to have some other skill set because there's nothing truly unique about running a sports team that you're going to learn in school. I'd rather you have some other skill set that you can bring that gets us to think in a different way. That to me is out of value. But you've still got the challenge that I get 20 resumes a week, minimum, minimum, saying I'll work for free. I just want a chance. I get some. I get one or two a month. I'll pay you to come work. Now, I know you're all smarter, and it doesn't apply to you because each and every one of you is different in your own way, right? <laughs> but it's true. It's true. There's just so many people applying for those jobs that it's just very, very difficult to get a job. Well, that wasn't... The answer you wanted, sorry. Yeah, this is but I can lie. You know what? It's a great sad. job. You all are a great job. I want to shape. hug everybody There's one There's so one much here. more demand than supply that you just graduate, and you're set for life. The iPad. Uh-huh. Which I know you use. Yeah. You have you have children. Yep. I'm sure they use. Maybe yep. mess around with it. Yep. And this is something that didn't exist, I don't think, as recently as what, two years ago? Two or three, yeah. You think of the impact that the iPads had on, on everybody's life. What do you think is next? What would be your like two predictions from you for the next five years? Things that will change our lives. Well, everybody knows everything's digital now, right? So people talk about um, conversion. There is no conversion anymore. That was 15 years ago. There used to be analog. There's no more analog. Everything's digital. And all the devices we use, other than maybe pen and paper and, pe and, and um, pencils, are digital. So your phone, your iPad, even your TV, they're all just different form factors of the same thing. Right? They've got an interface, they've got a way to communicate now, even the, your TV, your laptop. So now it's just a question of what, how much speed can go into the processor, how much memory can go into the processor, and what are the, de the um, development platforms on there. So you've got Apple with iOS, which is, is closed, but obviously the network effect, um, thanks Jan, um, that there's so many of them that people are obviously geared towards that. And then you have Android, which is out there for free. It's not as open as you think, but it's still far more open. And then you've got what's going on in television. And honestly, I think the coolest platform for development right now that I'm investing in and looking in are televisions. Because everybody talks about the second screen. You know, you've got what's going on on your, I've got two phones, right? Neither of which are Apple, but um, what's going on here. But these are still single tasking devices. And the iPad's a single tasking device. And that kind of screws up the formula because, yeah, you want to do all these things while you're watching sports on television or while you're watching TV, but when the phone rings or when you want to check your email or do something else, it's still single tasking. And so I think what's going to happen on television, by definition, because it's still got to show um, what's on the screen, all the other apps, I think, will, will enable multitasking and multiple apps going on at the same time. And I think the other big advantage on television, and you guys started to talk about this last time, and I don't think you got into it. One live, and Jonathan, I think, alluded when he said, look, I don't care about what other people do. People are still going to watch the games. The people are still going to go to the games. And that's because of the value of live. I think there's a huge misconception that social media drives internet, right? And that's wrong. Right? It, social media sprung from the internet, but social media is now far more connected to television and real events, live events, like going to a game, going to... Um, Watching the Oscars. Or whatever, yeah. right? Why? Because television, uh, particularly a live event, everybody gets it at the same time. Right, so if we put a TV on, we started watching Shark Tank Friday nights on ABC. Um, then after on. you order my book, yeah, it's doing great actually. Um, 
and we're, we're all watching the same thing and experiencing a communal experience at the same time and social media enables the watching of the television or the live event and the live event gives you something to tweet or status update or whatever else comes along, Pinterest, all at the same time. Whereas what's happening on the net, whether it's video, that's serialized. We don't all watch the video of Jonathan's um, the, the field goal, right? We're not all watching at the same time, so we're not all experiencing it at the same time. And over time, the value of the social media for that video drops considerably. So television is going to drive social media, and social media will drive television. So when you ask what's the next cool thing, big thing platform, I think it's TV. And people talk, what is the future of TV? Without question, the future of TV is TV. And while everybody's looking at all these other devices and thinking the internet's going to, to replace television, that's just wrong. It's just not, t TV actually, it, it may be more diluted in terms of individual shows, but in terms of what people are watching, television, look, even if you look at Netflix and Hulu, everything that, almost everything that people watch on Netflix and Hulu, or not all Netflix, let's say half on Netflix and all of Hulu, is driven by branded and value creation on television. And that's not going to change. So I think, at least with my um, investment philosophy, we're looking for creating software that runs on televisions um, more so than any other platform. Huh. Yeah, I mean, even that now, you, I've done this a few times. You could hook up your iPad to the TV, watch some show or whatever, and, and all of a sudden it's on the giant TV. So I, I agree with you. I don't think TVs are going to go away. Not even close. And it'll be interesting to see if you can just do everything from your remote control. This goes yep. back to your remote control theory. Yep. And so, The yeah, remote exactly control right. guys are going to make it. That's exactly right. I mean, again, because you also, also got to understand what the definition of television is. Yeah. Right? The definition of television is the best alternative to boredom. It seems like... It seems like, uh... <laughs> right? Yeah. There's nothing easier, and that's you know that's why everybody watches TV. And people, you know, I was having this conversation earlier. People say, well, young kids, you know, 18 to 34 demo, they're not watching as much TV. They're watching it online, and that's because the younger you are, the the less valuable your time is, and the more of it you have. And as you get older, your time gets more valuable. And the more valuable your time, the less you're willing to work at the discovery of content. You want it to come to you. You want it to be the path of least resistance. Television still does the best job of that. And social media makes it even less of a path of resistance because it's turned to, hopefully, HDNet, turned to ESPN, turned to the Mavs game, right? I just saw this tweet. Oh, this game is right on the line. Turn there as opposed to, okay, go to your phone or your lap, or go online to ESPN.com. And then if it's not right there on the front page, go to this URL or go in this link. And then, you know, still the reality is, Wi-Fi is meant to be screwed up. No one's Wi-Fi works, right? And so there's all those vagaries, and so television is, is definitely going to be the answer. I agree with you on the Twitter thing. It's pretty interesting, like, especially this season, it just feels like you'll get some tweet or you'll get a text or something like, Durant's got 24 with, yeah. with six left in the second quarter. All right, turn okay, it. Check it out, right? And it just you, seems like it fits with the league. And it doesn't work nearly as well if you're trying to watch it online. No. Because inherently it buffers, it's right? A delay. There's a delay. And so whether you're watching a concert, a news event, or a game, you're not watching the same thing. You, you can still get to it, but it's not as communal. And now, you know, you talk about instant gratification. You want to go to the net. No, the reality is if it's live, that's why ESPN has gone to almost all live, yeah. right? Almost everything is live. That's why we're we rebranding re and relaunching HDNet as access to go all live all the time because that's what's going to leverage the, com com the communal aspects of social media. And I think people miss that point, that the longer something's been available online, the less value it has. And the more immediate it is, the more value it has. And you also have, I think what's amazing, like if you get League Pass, I sound like I, like they're paying me to advertise League Pass, but I think it's incredible on the iPad. Like it's on cool. Valentine's Day, I missed the Jeremy Lin Hawks game because it was out with my family or whatever the game when he made the game winning shot. My, my Blackberry blew up, found out what happened, came home, just zoomed it up on the iPad, called it up, watched the fourth quarter. Like, hey, to five, five years ago, if you told me I would have been able to do that, I would have been yep. just flabbergasted. No, I mean, look, bits are bits. 
Yeah. Digital is digital, bits are bits. And it doesn't any digital device that supports video, you can watch them, and that's just the way it's going to be. But there's a difference between watching it in a communal situation, like we're all watching Dirk, you know, it's a close game or whatever, versus just check it out when you get a chance. Yeah. The value of check it out when you get a chance, even though it's viral, way down here. The value of, oh my God, we're all watching it, way up here, because then, you know, if something happens and people are jumping up and down, or people are tweeting, oh my God, did you see it, oh my God, you want to be part of that now, and that's what's different today versus the past. What would you change about Twitter if you could change one thing? I'd make it 141 characters. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, look, Twitter will be here until it's not, and then there'll be something else, and I don't think it'll be about number of characters. I just think it'll be about the device and how, I, I don't know, somebody will come up with a better idea because that's just the way it works. See, haven't we been saying that for three years then? It's been three years. It feels like they should have been challenged by well, a Facebook much smarter version things. of it. So you've got Facebook now with, that has subscribers so that you can get things out. So I, you know, if I'm trying to communicate something to people, I'll go on Google Plus because there's a geeky group that goes Google Plus, right? I'll go Facebook because that's more international, yeah. right? And it's, you, you have unlimited space and you can put graphics and video and everything in it. And then Twitter is more about, Twitter is more like um, PR Newswire. Right. PR, Twitter is more where you want to communicate something that you know is then going to be relayed to other people. And so that it, they, they each serve their own role, and who knows what else comes, out, comes along. All right, we're out of time. That's the end of the BS Report with Mark Cuban. Yeah. Thanks for uh, listening, everybody. It was fun. That was good. Thank you. Target the sound off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.